Welcome back. Today I want to show you a little bit of the history of sensors. So let's start with the simple one, which is the thermometer and when the thermometer was invented for the first time. We can see uh, Hero of Alexandria uh, almost 2000 years ago and this one was probably the first thermometer ever made. At a different temperature then those gases have a different pressure on the water. So depending on the pressure and depending on the temperature you have a different level of the water rising. This was okay, then we need to take another 1500 years for reaching the second one which is Galileo Galilei and he used similar method but he used the density of different liquids. So the density is also changing with different temperature and then those glass vessels are flowing inside another liquid depending on outside temperature. Another 100 years later then we got Fahrenheit and this one actually was the first real thermometer uh, the first thermometer that we are still using today, so it was with the mercury, you can see the scale of the, the temperature, because at a certain point uh, with Galilei you know more or less the temperature, but you don't have any scale at that point. If you want to have a scale, then Fahrenheit was the first one, and he put the scale at zero, uh, let me check my notes, so the zero is brine, water, ice and ammonium chloride, which is obviously something that you have at home for checking if something is at zero degrees. And some countries are still using it. Luckily for us, we got Celsius a few years later and then that, that was quite simple. Zero is when water freezes and 100 degrees is when water boils. That's a little bit more straightforward. Still not exactly precise, but luckily we got Kelvin a uh, few years later and this is the scale that we are still using. This one was for me at least the, the first sensor that was ever invented because you can check the temperature. I want to show you also the first thermostat or at least what I think was the first thermostat and it's the first loop system. This one was invented by Drebbel let's say a few years uh, ago and for me is the first loop system. So how does it work? You have this oven and you have fire from the bottom and you have also something that open and close on the top. So you choke the, the, the fire or you can make more air going in and then the fire gets bigger. You have also as a control you have a, a boiling water and this boiling water controls the arm for opening or closing the oven. If the heat is too much the water starts to boil and this arm will close the air vent and then the fire will choke. If the temperature is too low then the water is uh, going back, it's not boiling anymore and this one will open. This for me is the first loop system. You want to set the temperature and then the temperature remains more or less constant. Everything works just because of temperature, because of liquid boiling and because of mechanical system, so how this open and close. And this should give you also another a uh, very important point, 99% of the research which is done in, in sensor, it's application driven. Drebbel was doing this not for, for example, um, amplifying DNA, because this is the same system how the PCR works, but he was doing just for having a perfect cooked egg. And this is why he did the first thermostat. By the way, uh, Drebbel is also the first one that did the first submarine. I think that on the engineering point of view he is very close to, to Da Vinci. Naturally don't tell it to an Italian, but um, he did pretty impressive things on the engineering part. Going on the application I want also to show you another thing, so I want first to ask you, okay, do you know what this is? This one was a patent filed in 1971 and it's called the predictor. Have you ever seen one of those? Most probably not, but this is actually a pregnancy test. This one was the first patented pregnancy test. It worked in a really weird way in which you have to collect your urine, you need to mix it with different chemicals, to leave it overnight at room temperature, and then the next day you can check if there is a ring formed or not. It was really, really difficult to, to use. Now, if I ask you, do you know what this is? you probably say yes, because this is the, the most common pregnancy test that you can see 
on the market and it's practically everywhere. So even if the chemistry was well known at the time in, in 71, those tests have become standard only when they became simple to use. In the next lecture you will see how to make a paper, paper sensor, how to use a paper sensor and why they are so good. And this brings us to another point. Especially in the sensor research, you should always be thinking who is going to use your sensor, where, how, uh, a researcher, someone in the field, someone that never did any science class, um, should be autonomous. You should always be thinking about who is going to use your sensor. And I suggest you to well, definitely watch this video. Uh, the link will be on blackboard, whiteboard, what's the name of it tough nowadays? I don't remember. I will give you the link. I will send you the link. Um, it's from Don Norman and he also wrote this excellent book that it's the design of everyday things. And he explained when you design something you should always have uh, an idea of who is going to use it. So you start with an observation, you get an idea on how your sensor should work, then you make a prototype and then you start testing it. And the test is actually uh, the human center design. So if it works, if people can use it, then it's a good sensor. If people don't know how to use it or it's too difficult to use, then you make your observation again. It's difficult because this, this and this, and then you start the circle again. And this is very important for sensor development. If I have to use something in a supermarket or if I have to use something in the laboratory, those are two completely different sensors that I can develop. For example, um, this is Axis, this is our building, and for a long time this blue board was in front of the entrance, and this blue board was saying student entrance Axis Z. So you close your bike, you put your bike on the stand, you come in, and then they say, uh, look, this is not the student entrance. And they are right, because this is actually not axis Z, and this is not the student entrance. So you need to walk other 50 meters for reaching the, the real axis Z and the real student entrance. So this is very bad for user interface. So if I read this in, in big capital letter, I think that this is the student entrance and this is axis Z. But actually it's not like that. So a, a better and easier user interface would have been student entrance, no, or student entrance, just kidding, and that would be it. Uh, a few more minutes or where the field is going, so where the field of sensor and devices is going. So we are doing a lot more on lab on a chip, um, home kits and so on, so you want to have a point of care diagnostic tools for example. Uh, things about for example the COVID, it's better to have a home test, fast, easy and reliable, rather than going to the hospital and make the test. This is the difference between centralized testing and decentralized testing. Decentralized testing, if it's way easier and faster, you can probably do decentralized test of one million people. You cannot do centralized test on one million people. That's literally impossible. Then we have miniaturization. We know how sensor works, we know how device work. Now we want just to make them smaller, portable, and this is still for in-field operation. So if you want to shrink down a UVVs in the size of a cell phone, nowadays it's possible. And this is also very important for point of care, uh, diagnostics, and analysis in field. A huge amount of effort is going also for wearable sensor and wearable sensors are important because they are monitoring you 24 hours a day. So you can check your health uh, 24 hours a day without going to the doctor, for example. And then you can check a lot of different things directly by, for example, wearing an eye watch or a wristband that can check your temperature, that can check your heartbeat, that can check your ECG, um, and you have a lot of sensors like this. Similar story, for example, for glucose testing. Now you don't have to prick your finger anymore and check the blood, but you can have a sensor directly on your arm. Last but not least, we also are 
uh, developing a lot of cheap and fast sensors for third world countries. For the last few minutes, what are what are we going to discuss in this course? You saw more or less the schedule in the previous videos and what we are going to see. The first part, we are going to talk a lot about paper sensors, how do they work, why they are so useful, the pro and the cons of paper sensor, and we, we will compare those sensors to the glass sensor. I will show you that the chemistry used for modifying both the paper and the glass is more or less similar. What are the pro and the cons of paper against glass sensors? We are going to see what's the difference between a molecular sensor, so where uh, the molecule change uh, upon stimuli uh, against nanoparticle sensors. So we can also make nanoparticles and this one can be used as a sensor. What's the difference between uh, the molecule and the nanoparticle? We are going to do a lot with chip electronics, microcontrollers, you will use an Arduino for making your own colorimetric sensor at home and we will check different things with this colorimetric setup. You will also be designing in 3D and 3D printing QVET system for the Arduino that you are going to design. We are going to see hopefully in the lab how to make a microfluidic device only in PDMS but also during the course we will discuss a lot of different systems for making microfluidics devices and how to use them and why they are so interesting. We will also see the NMR, which is one of the best uh, analytical techniques for uh, studying chemical structure and chemical interactions. Usually I have a couple of guest lectures from professors in the Wageningen University. This year, as we are doing everything online, I decided to invite more people from around the world to explain how they are using sensor or how they are developing sensor. I think this is a little bit more interesting and more, uh, more fun to do. With this, uh, just to sum up, what are we going to see? We are going to see a lot of different sensors, so how chemical sensor works, if you have a complexation, uh, if they are working for reaction, or if you have a supramolecular interaction. We are going to see where to use those sensors, for example, in food, in soil, in water. We are going to use, see also a lot of different biosensors, uh, nanoparticles, how to use the UVVs, how to make a colorimetric sensor using the Arduino and also some fluorescent sensors. On the devices part, we are going to see paperworks, uh, how to use a smartphone for making a detection, a colorimetric detection. You will make, again, uh, the Arduino UVVs, but also Arduino fluorimeter. We are going to check NMR, how to make NMR microcoils, how to make microfluidics inside the NMR, so how to use microfluidics in the NMR. We are going to talk a lot about microfabrication because we'll for the microfabrication we are going to see a top-down approach but also a bottom-up approach. We are going to check a lot of different microfluidic devices and we are going to discuss lab ownership or organ ownership. Say it so, I would like to thank you and see you in the next video.